So let's talk about Acts 17 and Paul saying that we're of the offspring of God. So the Bible teaches that we're adopted children by faith in Christ, that God adopts us, that we are brought into the family of God. We become adoptive brothers to Christ by faith in Christ, and that we are, in John 1, given the right to become children of God by receiving Christ. Um, Mormonism instead teaches that we are universally, we're all pre-mortal sons and daughters of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. There's a sort of a hazy question about whether everyone in the world shares the same Heavenly Mother, but as a side note. Anyway, the idea is that there's some sort of pre-mortal sexual union, uh, some sort of bringing together of the two uh, gendered, uh, I'll call them demigod, superhuman deities, um, exalted humans that are called gods. And they beget these spirit children. And um, the celebration in Mormonism is that we're of the same species of God and that we have the same potential as God himself. So God is seen as on the same plane as us with respect to the class of being, the, the fundamental kind of being we are. He's at a different stage of development and we're behind and we can um, be exalted someday as a God and have our own worlds and so forth. Anyway, the passage that Mormons use in the New Testament, probably most forcefully to support this, it comes from Acts 17. So let's look at the context. Paul's in Areopagus. Um, well, let's back up here. Um, he's in Athens. And he's he's uh, waiting for his buddies in Athens, as far as, as far as I can tell. But he's provoked within him. His spirit is provoked when he saw that the city is full of idols. So the whole passage here starts at Paul being consternated by idolatry. That'll become important. He reasons in the synagogue with the Jews and with devout persons in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. So Paul goes to where he can find people to have conversations with, and he's promoting the gospel of Jesus. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, they talk with him, and they say, who's this new dude? Like, what does this babbler want to say? Um, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities. He's preaching Christ and the resurrection, but it's odd stuff. So they invite him to come speak at Areopagus. It's like, come to our university class and present your views. Um, but it sounds like this is more of the spirit of sort of pluralistic enjoyment of all, you know, hearing different views out. Fair enough. What a great ex opportunity to share. May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You're talking strange stuff. You're talking weird. You're talking funny stuff. You're talking, uh, you're talking about things that we're not used to. We want to know what you're talking about. What do you mean? So the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. They were, they were pretty chatty about philosophy and religion. So Paul stands in their midst, in the midst of the Areopagus, and he says, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So the God that you don't even know about, <laughs> which you which you kind of admit to having, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the pagans here are, are saying, if we missed a God, <laughs> let's just have a catch-all. We have, in programming, we have switch statements that say, in case it's A, do this. In case it's B, do this. And then we have a default case. It's like catches all the other stuff. And the, the pagans here had a, a catch-all. If we missed anything... Well, Paul's like, well, you missed something. <laughs> there is an unknown God, and I'm going to tell you about him. The God, and what is what's special about this God? The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples built by man, 
nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is not actually he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for indeed we indeed are for we are indeed his offspring. And that's the key, key statement Mormons are gonna seize upon. We'll come back to it. For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by man whom he has appointed. Of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So Paul starts his sermon by saying that he uh, can see they're very religious. And his whole experience in the city here starts with him being provoked by, uh, stirred up in his heart over all the idolatry, all the idols, all the statues. Oh, Paul is stirred within him. Uh, his, uh, he's not tickled by a desire most to enjoy pluralistic sort of fun intellectual discussions. No, Paul starts with the stirring in his heart, <clears throat> excuse me, a stirring in his heart over idolatry. So he preaches the gospel and um, he's invited to speak. And he says, I can see uh, you're very religious um, I can see, you know, you're very interested in in making sure that you get your your deity worship squared away. And I can even tell that you have an unknown God inscription altar on an altar and uh, a catch-all. So I'm going to tell you about the God you don't know. This God created everything and he's the Lord of heaven and earth. So he's not a local deity. Um, he create in this heaven and earth idiom phrase is saying he is the Lord of everything and he can't, uh, he doesn't dwell in a temple. You can't fit God in a room. Deity isn't the kind of thing that you can spatially locate in a temple. Nor is God uh, a needy God who needs humans. And he's not worshipped as though he needs anything. Because he's the giver. Everything we have, life and breath and everything, comes from him. He gives it. He's a, so this is an amazing apologetic. Uh, God, from God comes all things. He's not the kind of God who needs anything. And he's not the kind of God who lives in a temple. Uh, he's bigger than you realize. And all of humanity, with all of its geographic distribution, is sovereignly placed by God uh, for purposes of a long-term redemptive historical uh, bringing together, uh, helping people point people to, to God. That's a very mysterious verse. Let's talk about that sometime. Um so he goes on to quote two pagan poets, um, two pieces of pagan poetry, which are, uh, at least one of them is about being, at least this one, uh, about Zeus. So Paul doesn't think Zeus is God, nor does he think the attributes attributed to Zeus do an adequate job of describing who the true God is. Um, Paul uh, doesn't want 
to endorse Zeus. In fact, he's talking about the unknown God, so to speak. But Paul is taking passages from these this pagan poetry directed to a false god, and he's repurposing it to describe the quote unknown God. So what 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 language does Paul think conceptually has instructional value here? What kind of mental map overlap can I tap into, Paul says, to help communicate who God is and why we should worship him and not other stuff or representations with that stuff? Um, one, in God, we live and move and have our being. So we owe our very existence, of living, of animation, of activity, of thinking, of doing, our moving. And we have our very being, our very existence, owing to God. We come from God's uh, creative uh, authority. Uh, we're sourced in him. We come from him. He created us. The very core of who we are is created by God. And our very life within ourselves is, is comes from God. Another, we are indeed his offspring, which I think is really continuing the idea that we are sourced in God. We have our genesis in God's uh, authority and creation and power. We owe who we are to God. We are his offspring. It's another way of saying that. So what's Paul's motive? Uh, it's interesting. Paul's not simply quoting these passages from the pagan poetry to Zeus and so forth nakedly or alone or sequestered. He's using them in the context and flow of an argument. He says, hey, because we're God's offspring, because we we, in him, we live and move and have our being because we derive our very being from God. We ought not to think that God, this divine being, this unknown God, is something like the material stuff that we make images with. We have to use human imagination. So what's interesting is the, the images we form with this stuff derives from the art and imagination of man. So there's a there's a, a lesser to greater to greater argument here. The images formed come from and are derived from or sourced in man's imagination and art. So if if that stuff, if these images are lesser than man and man is derived, it's interesting, um, the images are derived from man, and man is derived from God. Um, the images that we make with stuff, the statues, are uh, sourced in man, but man is sourced in God. So Paul is saying, look, if God's greater than you and you owe your very existence to his imagination, to God's art, to God's power and authority. And, um, if we derive our existence from God, how inappropriate is it for us to worship God through these imaged representations? Um, because doing so speaks poorly of, a of the divine being which attributes to the divine being a kind of material uh, characteristic, set of characteristics that aren't true of him. So looking at the context, let me ask you, my, my friends, my listeners, does Paul intend here to teach that we're of the same species of God uh, from a pre-mortal event or an act of procreation between gendered heavenly parents. And that we are of the same uh, class of, of being. 
let me let me let me press this in more. Is Paul intending to teach of a worldview where there are countless other worlds that are up in the heavens that our God did not create? An infinite regress, an infinite ancestry, each of which has worlds without number that our particular deity was not responsible for making. In other words, is Paul promoting a worldview where a subset of ultimate reality is governed by our particular deity? Is Paul teaching a worldview where he thinks our deity has ever needed anything? Has our God ever been needy in his deity? Um, is Paul teaching of a worldview where God is not the ultimate giver? So in Mormonism, God is downstream. Upstream are the ancestral gods, the, the heavenly grandfather, heavenly great grandfather, who gave our God everything he has. Our God has received everything he has from his spiritual ancestry. His heavenly father helped him become a god. His spirit uncle, perhaps, uh, a Christ from another set of worlds, helped him either atone, uh, have his sins atoned for, or you know, however his exaltation was achieved. Um, is Paul teaching of a worldview where our heavenly father has what he has because he received it from a previous generation of the gods? Um, or is Paul teaching of a worldview here where God is the ultimate, the first, the most high giver who has never received a gift, who is, who is the, the source of everything good, true, and beautiful, of all life anywhere for all worlds, all planets, everything. He's not a regional deity for some slice or subset of the cosmos. He is the God of heaven and earth, a phrase that is not meant to be local in this uh, word category. It's meant to be, to stretch out, to be universal, to be all. It's not meant to be relativized to some region of the cosmos. It's meant to mean everything. So Mormonism teaches of a, a regional cosmic deity who's not responsible for the creation of everything, nor is he responsible for the actual creation of the stuff in this very local world we're in. He's just a reorganizing what already exists. And he has been needy in his past, receiving the help of previous deities to become a god. Um, and in Mormon theology, traditional Mormon theology, at least in the B.H. Roberts sort of view of things that's popular today, in terms of the, it's called the tripartite model of intelligences and spirits, where intelligences are uh, self-existent, uh, co-eternal, self-aware, ego-identity persons who exist apart from the will of God. And by, by that I mean they existed before God, they even had a relationship with God. In other words, Mormonism teaches that intelligences don't exist because someone else created them. So, uh, is Paul teaching a worldview like modern Mormonisms, which teaches that we have our very self-existence, our inner core intelligence life um, was co-eternal, not owing to the gift of God or the creative acts of God. Is Paul teaching that we are co-eternal with God and did not derive our very life and being and inner mental activity from God? Uh, no. Is Paul teaching that God that God is in the same, uh, that God is made of, of uh, material stuff. No, he's in a different class. He's not like that. So the, the, the local meaning here, the, the, what I mean by local is the, sort of the, 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 the co-text, the, the immediate context, is that if, if images formed by us with gold, silver, and stone are derived from the art and imagination of man, and we are derived from God, and we actually have our, we live and move and have our very being sourced from God, derived from God, then we ought not worship God like he's, you know, able to be represented by gold and silver and stone and stuff. 
He's bigger than that. He He's the one who is responsible for the creation of all things. He's never been needy. Uh, he's everything good and true and beautiful has come from God, life and breath and everything. He's not downstream from other deities. Uh, he's not participating in a system larger than himself. So when Paul says, you know, he quotes from this pagan poet poem, which was originally directed to worship Zeus, is he promoting a Mormon worldview um, or is he promoting a more classic Christian worldview? Thanks for listening, friends.